what young people can do. Once we get to the White House at 10 in the morning, we're gonna hold 70 minutes of silence. Last year, we held 70 minutes of silence to honor each victim of the Parkland shooting. But in addition to honoring the victims of the Parkland shooting, we're gonna think about all lives lost to gun violence. We are just a group of Montgomery County, Maryland students who um, lead a local organization. And our mission statement is to fight locally and nationally for the issues that affect Montgomery County students. We're sending a message to Congress um, and people all over the country that the student movement is not backing down, that the energy is still here and we're here to pass in Senate 42 to ensure universal background checks on all gun sales. We think it's really important that we demonstrate sort of like the power of youth in this movement. The job of a senator and a House representative is they're supposed to take their constituents seriously and if a group of a thousand to five thousand students are sitting outside the Capitol demanding change, you know, how are you going to say no to that? Yeah. So it's like 1 a.m. <laughs> I finally started making my posters and I just finished them. It says life, liberty, and the pursuit of not getting shot at school. And I got another one on the back which says, I'm missing school because they're missing their lives. So it's the day of the walkout. Um, we're going to be printing out leaflets, half sheets for kids to read when they're on the bus. All of this activism, all of these walkouts has really brought our county together. Where are we going? To the march? Yes. What? Why are we walking out? Because we need gun control now. Yes, we do. I'm here with Poolville High School for Montgomery County, Maryland. <laughs> Alright, so we just got to the U.S. Capitol. We walked here all the way from the White House. We have thousands of students coming here. Probably way more than last year. We're here to remind people that we vote next. If they don't make some serious changes right now, then they're out. A year ago today, we marched to this very spot. A year ago today was a month after the Parkland shooting and everything had changed. We were angry, grieving, scared for our own lives. We have been failed by every single institution that's supposed to protect us, by the people in that building behind us, by previous generations, by anyone who ignores our pleas to survive. Our friends are dying. So we march. We take the country by storm again and again and again because we grieve again and again and again. Because we carry the weight of death on our shoulders like a gift we never asked for. So today, I implore all of you to be loud. School may tell you to be quiet, to be silent, to not speak your truth, but here you need to be loud. Loud enough for them to hear you on the top floor of that building.
So we don't think that police and prisons keep us safe. In fact, we think that they add more violence and add more harm. You know, they still human, but they let their job to get the best of them. Like, they live a life like us too. They gotta pay taxes and things like that too, but they feel like when they in the blue badge, they can do whatever they want. I think rage was the only way for me to like, comprehend all that I felt. I had like six, eight friends die. Like a lot of people pass away. The person that you was just with uh, can die three hours later, especially in Chicago. You never know when it's your day to die. Coming to Asada's, I was just like kind of lost and looking for a place to put a lot of my anger around the things that were going on. After the first meeting, I went to join because it gave me the feeling of family like that I could come to this space and feel safe. I learned about Asada Shakur, feminism, how to be an organizer, becoming a better organizer. I was looking for answers and like, Asada was just the first place that that rage was like rightfully answered. In the first place where I saw a lot of other other people's rage being validated. So my name is Paige May. I am the co-founder of Asada's Daughters and currently work as the organizing director. Well, I had the idea, it felt like there was a need to create a container for young people to be able to participate in meaningful ways in the movement for black lives. People need an outlet. It gave me the feeling of like I could come to the space and speak my mind and not be ridiculed by anyone. I think when we started, being naive really worked in our favor. I, I don't think we understood the scale of what we would become and thus what we had to build and what we had to do. And it's been a hugely steep learning curve. But at the time, it, it was just one of those moments that just made sense and it, it really truly felt like we have everything we need. Even though we don't know exactly what we're doing, we have everything we need. No Cop Academy is a coalition of multiple organizations. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of this city, proposed a $95 million Cop Academy. This building was proposed to be built in an area where six out of 50 Chicago public schools were torn down. We just think the money could be better allocated and that's like the goal of the No Cop Academy campaign. There's a long, long history of young people engaging in protests, particularly teenagers engaging in protests. Through No Cop, you're seeing young black people insist you will hear us. We have a voice, and if you want to stand up, just stand up. You don't have to back down just because you're 16. You don't have to back down just because you're 13. You can still have a voice, no matter how old you are. We filled City Hall with more people than I've ever seen. They could not get a sentence out. What happens often is that young people are used to show something and like used in ways that we don't agree with. I believe in people saying no. I believe in people disobeying. No one is born this like incredible radical person, right? And that we should start to look at what helps, what pushes people in those ways. We're trying to, to make sure that young folks in our neighborhood have the tools that they need to survive, um, and to thrive, and to organize. So this is the Asada's HQ, or home quarters. We wanted to have a space in the neighborhood where young people from that neighborhood could help transform a building that had been abandoned. Everything from the colors to the where the bookcases are to how the books are arranged to that green square is a story behind it of a young person who made that decision, who was a part of building this into what it is. This neighborhood has one of the highest percentages of vacant lots in the city. This is one of the few buildings that's left, and this is a result of, of divestment and intentional displacement of the people that live here. Youth activists in Chicago's Washington Park neighborhood are mourning the loss of their headquarters this week after the city knocked down their building. Our young people saw our space as a whole, as a way to focus on building up their dedication to restorative justice. Chicago police say they are investigating the incident. I personally have faced a lot of hard times. My depression got so bad last year. It was last May when I actually made um, a suicide plan. It felt like the only other option I could do was end my life. Hi, I'm Emily. 
and I'm the founder of Sovereign Scene Mental Health. Our goal is pushing legislation for education for mental health and self-care. Sovereign Scene right now is working on the mental health rally, which we are very excited to have. We are using that as a platform to lift the voices of people who are already working for that legislation. S-244 is a bill that we are trying to get passed to make it mandatory for mental health education in all public schools in Massachusetts. Basically taking the already existing physical health curriculum and intertwining it with mental health. When we talked about mental health in schools, I felt ostracized. I had no idea why I was feeling the way I did. It was only the first quarter of school. I was really behind. I was not doing the right thing, not doing homework, lying, stealing. My girlfriend broke up with me because she saw what was happening and she was like, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. And I guess I just fell into this hole. I thought I was going crazy. I didn't understand why none of my friends felt the same way I did. And I didn't understand why nobody could relate to me when I, when I did open up about it. Sovereign Scene brings people together from all different backgrounds. Every person experiences mental health and mental illnesses differently but it's about addressing those differences and also talking about mental health in a way that we can all relate to. Juliana and I went to Michael's and we got some ribbon so we can make ribbons for mental health. As a result of people wearing these ribbons, we believe that it will help start conversations. Like just learning about it from a young age, it it helps everyone in the long run, you know? Like you learn to tie your shoes when you're like first grade, probably younger, because you need to learn how to tie your shoes for the rest of your life. You need to live with your brain for the rest of your life. You need to learn how to take care of it. He has 49% of youth at some point up to the age of 18 will have the experience of a mental health condition. Mental health is a part of all health. And we've recognized that Health education is important in our schools, but we aren't doing anything about mental health education. While mental health is talked about more as we get older, it's often addressed after the problems begin. Mental health needs to be addressed at the beginning of a person's journey. We want this to be an ongoing plan for education. Mental health as a whole should be advocated for and should be a source of strength and unity instead of shame and weakness. There's no like one recovery path that you can just take and it will just work for everybody and that's really important to understand. Things start with the youth and the earlier we're educated about it, then I think the, the more it will make a difference. Racism shows itself in Milwaukee by us being one of the most segregated cities. I wouldn't want to raise a black kid here. If you are black and brown in this city, it is one of the worst places in America for you. Growing up in Milwaukee, there's a lot of over-policing. And I've experienced that with like being pulled over, being uh, questioned by the police for like literally just like existing uh, in places that I don't think I should be. Basically, marked as criminals. Leaders Igniting Transformation um, is a sort of new youth of color um, organization. Our slogan is the future is young, black, brown, and lit. We protest, we canvass, try to get people out to vote so we can help the community more. Going into high schools, being able to communicate um, the importance of voting. The school to prison pipeline, it is the practice of putting more into policing and criminalizing young people than it is nurturing them. All the police officers and the metal scanners were not in prison, but the school is basically making it like a prison. If you're in an environment where you really feel like you're in prison, your mindset is going to be, I'm going to prison. A place that was supposed to be safe is not safe at all. May 31st of 2018, we blocked legislation that would have mandated uh, Milwaukee Public Schools teachers and administrators to call police for suspected criminal activity on students. For us was just asinine that somebody would put on paper, you know, if you suspect students of criminal activity without any proof, your first step is to call the police. To be able to win this campaign was really just proof that like, what we say we can do, we can actually do. This year, our work is centered around removing police from our schools. They propose this budget where there is a huge amount of money being spent on school safety and security guards and metal detectors. Today at the Milwaukee Public School board meeting, we plan to make our presence heard. 
The first communication is action on a request to approve a technical amendment to the April certificated appointments list. The administration recommends that the board approve the Approve the technical oh, amendment on the April. Mr. Chair, yes, would you like to take a recess at this time? Yes, please do so. Please so noted. To not do so, you decided to prioritize policing and security in our budgets. This in turn has led to higher suspension rates and more students having police contact. The belief that young people of color need to be policed and watched instead of nurtured is a result of internalized racism. But our future, not our failure. The way we transform the protest and activism energy into voting, it's going to be organizations like LIT going out, talking to people. It's going to be authentic leadership. There are people who get elected with only a few hundred votes. So I know I know a few hundred people, right? So I know we have power to be able to affect change. I thought people didn't listen to us because, you know, we're kids. Wow. We actually have a voice right here, right now. Like Us protesting and canvassing is a good way to communicate with people. When I think about the landscape of the 2020 election and where Wisconsin falls into that and where LIT falls into that as a group that is mobilizing young voters of color that will literally decide the 2020 election and how much power um, young people of color have in this moment, in this city, in this country, it's a beautiful thing. Sixty-five years after Brown v. Board, and here I am talking about segregation in New York City, one of the most diverse cities in the world. My name is Lennox Thomas, and I'm in the 12th grade. Teen Say Charts is a student advocacy organization, and we're about integrating New York City public high schools. My name is Tiffany Torres, and I'm an uprising senior in high school. For me, applying to high school was kind of tricky, my parents being immigrants from the Dominican Republic, I didn't have a lot of support. My name is Marcus and I'm a senior at Pace High School. I grew up in Bushwick, Brooklyn. My grandma was one of the people fighting for integration back in her day and I'm fighting for the same thing now. And I would think that there should have been a big change from the time that I went up to the time that he going to school. We actually have a more segregated school system than it was 65 years ago. Although African Americans and Latinos make up 70% of all public school students, they make up barely 10% of students in elite public high schools. We didn't find out about the specialized high school tests until a week before the test was administered. There was no support whatsoever. I took the specialized high school admissions test twice. I failed both times. Though I surpassed the academic requirements for the school, I was not accepted. I really started to like get angry. I was resentful towards the way the system works and how it targets students of color. It wasn't until I discovered Teens Take Charge <laughs> that I realized that I could actually contribute. Teens Take Charge has three main proposals to integrate the schools. The first proposal is to introduce academic cutoffs so that there's a mix of high performing and low performing students in the school. The second is a more transparent high school directory book. The third is our top 7% plan. If every specialist high school reserved spots for the top 7% of every middle school, they would be diverse and represent the actual demographics of New York City. We'd have multiple sit downs with policymakers, but we realized that nothing was changing. We were having the same conversation. We're going to take matters into our own hands, and so we're going to disrupt your day. So I ask you all, where is our mayor? It was our first rally. We planned it in two weeks. We had over 600 students come out, and we told students, if you go to a white and Asian school, wear a white t-shirt. If you go to a black and Latinx school, wear a black t-shirt. We had them sit on opposite sides, and we can clearly see segregation. I think people were really inspired after the rally to keep fighting.
Well, we would love to let the grown up solve the problem, but the issue is that you guys are not solving the problem. At this point, it's too late for me. I can't go back in time. It's not about you, it's about those who come after you. And the reason why I'm doing it is because I hope that my children can go to an integrated school system. I refuse to be another black male student who just couldn't make it. I refuse to be compliant with the system that allows my people to leave their classrooms just to walk straight into a prison cell. We demand change and we demand it now. My parents didn't really care about like what sex education I was getting. I feel like a lot of teens in Tucson can relate to that, especially teens who are Latinos. There's a big taboo on sex ed, specifically in the Latino community. In the health classes, they kind of shamed people for having sex and they only teach abstinence only. It's been proven ineffective, it's just that Tucson and Arizona are behind. My name's Emily Morel and I'm 17. I'm an intern at El Rio RAP, which stands for Reproductive Health Access Project, and so I teach sex ed to teens. My name is Miranda Escobar. I actually got started in RAP in June 2017, uh, which was when RAP first started, so I was one of the first members. I was super excited to become a part of something that is focused on helping uh, young people in the community. Here at Real Rap, we use the peer-to-peer -peer model to teach comprehensive sex ed. So we believe that since we're teens, that we can understand teens uh, better than like adult teachers do. The peer-to-peer -peer comprehensive sex ed component is a huge part of Rap, which is where we as youth leaders come in. When teens check into our walk-in clinic, they see us. We follow through with a presentation. So none of the methods discussed so far are protected from STIs. That's why using a condom every time is really important. We talk about sex ed, different kinds of birth control, STI testing, pregnancy testing. If they want to be seen by a provider, they can get any service they want for free same day. And we also talk about consent and what are healthy relationships because we feel like that's a big, like, important factor to comprehensive sex ed. So here are some red flags of non-consent. Um, so they pressure you or guilt you into doing things that you may not want to do. Uh, they make you feel like you owe them. They react negatively if you say no. At our clinics, mostly girls come, and we want everyone to come because we feel like everyone needs this information that we're teaching. My brother, Daniel, he's 15, he's younger than me. One day I was like, you should come to the clinic. Because I'm a shy person, I feel like talking to a large crowd of people is like not my go-to thing. The best part of being with RAP and being an intern is getting that courage to do things that I wouldn't have done. I first found out about RAP through my friends. They saw an Instagram post and they told me about it. After I got involved as a patient, I was like, wow, like these are teens doing this. Like Teens are going to be real with you. They're not going to sugarcoat anything. So I was like, I really have to get involved with this. So right now I'm volunteering. So we know that as of today, RAP has served over 4,000 young people in the Tucson community. There's not really another program like us that's so beneficial to like our community and it shows. Because of this group, I'm always going to want to be involved in education around these sensitive topics and making sure that people's lives aren't being put in danger because of misinformation. Uh, my name is Arika Bennett. I'm the executive director of Mississippi Votes. We are a youth-centered civic engagement organization dedicated to trying to get young people integrated into the electoral process. Voting is important because it's your voice. And for you not to use your voice, that's terrible. We have an all-star cast of young folks doing amazingly dope work. I am a young black woman, born and raised in Mississippi, who voted today, hence the sticker. I'm Joshua Evans, and I approve this message. The challenges to voting in Mississippi are many. The voter rolls are riddled with inaccuracies, there is an immense lack of voter education, and a complete disinvestment in the most vulnerable communities. Mississippi's antiquated voting laws have led to the disenfranchisement of swaths of potential voters. We are in high time of 
the Up to S campaign right now. It's an eight week intensive grassroots mobilization campaign. This week, the week after, on up until election day, there are folks in several different counties knocking on doors, making phone calls, text banking. We are on almost all of the campuses in the state of Mississippi, all the colleges and universities, and they're also a major part of the Up to Us campaign. So today we are hosting a, a booth to provide uh, students with information on who's running for what, provide them an opportunity to sign up for one of our voting platforms, as well as sign pledge cards so that we know that they're going to be at the polls on November 5th. We've just been kind of like grabbing students as they've been walking past. We've also offered them the opportunity to uh, make a boomerang with one of our signs. Social media is very important to us because we deal with mostly young people. America. For the November 5th elections, I have 25 volunteers that I'm organizing. I'm excited. Yay, come on. My canvassers are out there to let people know that it's an election. The election is very important. And just get out there and vote. Vote no coming election? Yes. When they see young people out here and we're trying to get people registered <laughs> to vote, that might make them more you know, excited to do it, and we are the future, so. The Up To Us campaign is going digital. <laughs> We're hitting people's phones with ads and campaigns. It's up to us. We're all on Instagram and Twitter. We're doing everything that we can to reach everybody in every corner of the state. When we fight, we win! When we fight, we win! Folks voted in record numbers in 2018 during a midterm election. Black women got elected to these local judicial seats. 2019 to 2021, I want people to pay attention to who we elect to the legislature, to who we elect in the DA races, because those people inevitably shape our everyday lives. Did you vote yet? Did you vote yet? For the first time in my whole lifetime, a generation of new voters have this incredible opportunity to define the next decade of our lives. Go vote November 10th! Young people in Mississippi have always risen to the occasion, particularly young people of color. We honestly know what's at stake. I know Mississippi can change. window.